Thank you very much. And well, particularly thank you, Antonio and uh, Concha, for accommodating uh, dinosaurs such as myself who <laughs> never made it the past uh, the black or now whiteboard stage. Well, I would have preferred a blackboard, but I'm, <laughs> I'm so flexible. And you know, <laughs> at any rate, so this is joint work with uh, Conchita D'Ambrosio, who is now at the University of Luxembourg. And it's a paper on uh, social index numbers, in this particular case, uh, mobility, social mobility. And uh, this, I, uh, it was only in recent years that I actually came back uh, to issues of that nature. That's actually related uh, to with the interests of my co-author. She's uh, basically involved in uh, not only theoretical, but also more empirical issues. Well, she's much more empirically inclined than I am. My empirical inclination is zero at best. <laughs> but, uh, but apparently there is, uh, there is a there is some, uh, again, many of you will know this much better than I do. There is some interest within the European Union to look at indicators such as social exclusion, mobility, etc. And uh, again, uh, for me, it's an interesting topic because, uh, again, I've worked on, uh, in, on inequality, poverty, etc. before. And uh, mobility, actually, especially this, what, it, what we call rank mobility, has one interesting aspect to me and that is that it's uh, by definition something that uh, involves different periods that it's by it's by definition intertemporal right I mean we can look at poverty or inequality over time but there is nothing uh, wrong with uh, just looking at inequality or, or poverty and in a single period mobility on the other hand is different because uh, without uh, movement there can be no no mobility at all right so mobility means within a society whether people move up or down according to income wealth social class in general could be anything i mean but we're not restricted to uh, any specific interpretation and again it could be income wealth class in england it would be class and uh, or, or accent for that matter, right? I mean, I spent a couple of years in England, and uh, if two English people meet for the first time, they know nothing about each other. As soon as they open their mouths, they know, well, this is uh, upper middle class, sort of three notches down from the lowest upper class. It's <laughs> Of course, it's difficult with uh, non-natives, and I guess it's, that's why people always felt a little uncomfortable around me, and things didn't work out all that well. But that could also be because uh, I, mean, I'm, I think I'm a bit of a weirdo by most people's standards. So at any rate, I digress, I digress. So what, what do we mean by rank mobility? Again, we have basically uh, two observations. It could be income distributions, etc. But in our case, because it's what we call rank mobility, uh, but we didn't make this up. There are, there are earlier contributions. I'll mention them when, as I go along. By rank mobility, we mean we just look at uh, how people or families move from uh, one period to the next in terms of where they stand in society. Again, it could be income distribution, social status, etc. So the basic information we have is we have individuals. That's not a good start, but there are others. Ah, here we go. Let's say we have N individuals, at least two of them. Otherwise, it wouldn't be very exciting. And for each individual, and for each unit uh, that we have in this society, we observe uh, where they are in the, in, the, in the rank distribution. So we observe an ordering R0. That's an ordering in period zero. Again, that's not a preference or anything. That's a ranking of individuals, right? So this is an ordering defined on this set of uh, individuals. Is that number 15 is the uh, top of the list. There could be an indifference, of course, especially if you think about classes or social status. Typically, you would have very, very thick indifference curves or different sets here. And you want to compare this to a ranking that you observe in the following period. Now, in that case, and that's something, again, that, is, uh, that has been discussed in the literature, but there is not much theoretical work about it. There is one paper by uh, D'Agostino and Dardanoni. It's in JET, I think, 2009. They've looked at this problem, and, uh, but they look at it from a very different angle. 
again, they're more statistically inclined than, uh, than I am or <laughs> we are. And they look at it from in, in terms of uh, transition or partial permutation matrices. And consequently, their axioms are very different from ours. What they come up, the rules, the uh, mobility measures they come up with are, are quite different as well. So what we do basically is uh, we think of this, we think of movement as uh, distance, as, as how different are these two orderings, right? For example, if you, if you, if you reverse uh, everyone's ranking, suppose you have a strict ranking, 1 to n, and in the next period suddenly it gets reversed and it's on top, 1 is at the bottom. This seems to us that's uh, as mobile as you can possibly get, right? So the notion of uh, how different these two orderings are, to us, seems very natural to uh, approach this problem of saying how much mobility is involved in moving from uh, one ranking of the population to the other. So as uh, Antonio mentioned in the title, we are looking at variable population issues. That's relatively rarely done in, in that literature, but uh, it can actually be accommodated quite easily to some extent. So what we're looking at is a mobility measure M that has as its domain the union over all possible population sizes. And again, so this is uh, the set of uh, positive integers. We exclude the case of one individual because it's trivial. And these pairs are from uh, script Rn times Rn, these are just, script Rn is just a set of all orderings over this set of individuals. Right, we have orderings of, over individuals, and that, that's the Cartesian product. So you map this into R plus. So we assume that mobility cannot be negative, but that's a totally innocuous assumption. Right? Although it, what, it, what is uh, important is that uh, but again, innocuous is that uh, there is a lower, there is a lowest level, namely a level where there is no mobility at all, and we'll come to that in a moment. What I should mention is uh, what our work is based on, is um, some of the literature on uh, measuring the distance between orderings, or measuring the distance between relations in general. But in our case, it will be orderings. But again, and by an ordering, I mean uh, reflexive, complete, and transitive relation. And we explicitly allow for indifference. And again, for us, I think this is very important because if you have different social classes, I mean, there will be a lot of indifference. So the measure that we uh, propose is a variation on uh, what's called, what's often called a candle or a candle, oh, sorry, well, the candle measure is uh, the equivalent in statistics. Again, I don't want to go there, but uh, if, you, if you look into it in terms of uh, comparing, or not, not comparing, but uh, Measuring the distance between orderings, it's, the, it's what is usually referred to as the Kamini or Kamini Snell distance. And uh, it's been, uh, in my opinion, one of the most convincingly uh, argued and axiomatized notion of, uh, of distance when, you have, uh, when, when you're talking about uh, relations. It has also has, in my opinion, a very natural interpretation. And again, it suits the purpose of, if, in my opinion, it suits this purpose of uh, expressing the notion of mobility very well. So let me just write down what the Kamini distance is. So if you take any population size n, any two orderings are not in R1. The mobility measure associated with the Kamini distance for this pair of orderings <coughs> is just the cardinality of the first relation minus the second plus the cardinality of the opposite set difference. This may look uh, somewhat abstract, but uh, there is a very intuitive uh, explanation or interpretation of the Kamini distance. Basically, what it does is, if you it looks at two relations of orderings in that case, and it counts how many elementary changes you have to make in order to arrive uh, from one relation to the other. Let me just give you a simple example for three agents. 
if we have three agents, we have uh, 13 possible orderings. And I'll, I'm not going to write them all down here. I'll just give you a little slice of it. So with three agents, we could have a, an ordering one, two, three. One is on top, two is second, three is third. We could have one and two in a tie for first. We could have two strictly better than one, which in turn is strictly better than three. And we can have uh, two alone on top and one in three at the bottom. Then we just go all the way around until we arrive here again. This is our universal indifference relation where all three of them are indifferent. What the Kamini distance does is again it just looks at uh, the number of changes we have to make, or minimal changes we have to make in moving from one relation, from one ordering to the next. Here that's just a single step. Right? All we do is we add uh, the pair 2, 1 to this relation. Same here, that's just a single step. That's one step and so on. Now what we get here is a little different. In order to move from universal indifference to this ordering, if we only consider orderings, we have to make two steps. Right? Because here you have to basically move 1 and 2 above 3. And that requires two changes, but uh, if you do one change at a time, you end up in, in the intermediate step with the relation that's not an ordering. So that's where this two comes from as a distance. And the same is true over here. All right, so you get the picture, right? With if you move three upwards, it's just one step. From here to here? Yeah. No, it's the same thing because uh, you have to add two pairs. You have to add the pair three one and the pair three two, right? But if you do, if it, it, it doesn't matter whether you go up and down. Yeah, it's it's, same, it's it's entirely symmetric. Yeah. Again, I don't mention the rest. It follows basically the same uh, structure. So what happens is what the Kamini distance does is it says the distance. It's just the uh, length of the shortest path from one relation to the next. So for example, the distance between one two three and two and one three indifferent is three. Distance between this relation and this is uh, three as well. And uh, again, you can fill in uh, the blanks for, t for three agents. It's uh, quite manageable because again, there are only 13 possible orderings. As n gets higher, it becomes messier. For four, there are 75. For five, there are 540 something, etc. So, it, but well, there is a there's a recursive formula, the the ordered Bell numbers that gives you. Uh, it gives you the number of possible orderings, but that's again just a remark on the side. All right. Now, what's so hot about the Kamini distance? Well, again, I think it, it satisfies some extremely plausible properties. Let's just write them down. So, one is uh, the first one is zero at identity, as we call it. Actually, to be precise, we should say zero at identity only. And it just says, pick any population size, any two orderings of the corresponding set of uh, individuals. And you say that mobility in moving from R0 to R1 is zero if and only if, well, nothing happens. Again, I was tempted for a long time to uh, slightly modify this and call it uh, the uh, England axiom. Clearly, I'm obsessed with it. Mobi mobility is zero if and only if the country under consideration is England. <laughs> but my co-author would never let me get away with it. Um, clearly, my time in England has left a lasting impression on me. Sorry, I'll cut it out. <laughs> All right, so again, that's, uh, I mean, if there is mobility, if there is no mobility, it should be zero. If there is mobility, it should be positive. The second one is symmetry. And that just says whether we move from R0 to R1 or from R1 to R0 shouldn't make any difference. And again, that's just because we're measuring mobility as opposed to something like upward mobility where the direction matters. But if you just look at mobility, the direction is irrelevant. So again, for all n for any two orderings of the individuals. If you look at mobility, 
when you move from R1 to R0. It's just the same as mobility if you move from R0 to R1. Next is the triangle inequality. Again, it makes so clearly that it has an obvious geometric interpretation. If you move from one relation to from one ranking to the next, if you take a detour, that shouldn't make things shorter, right? So the triangle inequality. It's just the usual. Right? Take any n. Take three relations, R0, R1, R2. And it says that if I move from R0 to R2, then this move should uh, not involve more mobility than moving from R0 to R1 first, and then adding a move from R1 to R2. Again, everything perfectly uh, standard. Only two more for now. Uh, one is uh, anonymity. Excuse my handwriting, but again, if, it, if there's something you can't read, just let me know. But I think it's pretty much everything is self-explanatory. As, as I told you, it's, I think these axioms are very, very mild and very plausible. So anonymity just says how we label the individuals shouldn't matter. So again, take any population size, take any two orderings, and take any bijection that takes the set of individuals into itself. If we want to look at the mobility involved in moving from the permuted ordering to the new ordering, we simply get what we had in the first place. And finally, one axiom that's a little more demanding but still very plausible again in this in this context is additivity. And what additivity does is it says that uh, if you look at the triangle inequality and this relation R1 is what is called between R0 and R2, the inequality should be satisfied with a strict equality. Now what do I mean by uh, betweenness? So we say that R1 is between R0 and R2 if the intersection of R0 and R2 is contained in R1, which in turn is contained in the union of R2. Again, may it might look a little abstract in this set theoretic formulation, but all it says is that R1 is on the shortest path between R0 and R2. So remember, I just erased it, but for example, we had 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 3. We had uh, universal indifference. Now, if you look at uh, this relation, which is 1, 2, 3, and those two relations, if we move from this relation to this relation, this relation lies on the shortest path, right? We have to go through, there is no shorter path than going through this relation, through this one, to this. But remember, here we have a distance of two. So one, two, three, the, the universal indifference is most definitely not between those two relations because it does not lie on the shortest path. All right, so again, uh, additivity just says, if, we have, if it so happens that the re relation is uh, between two other relations, then the triangle inequality should be satisfied with an equality. So additivity says, again, take any n, R0, R1, and R2. If R1 is between 
R0 and R2, then we want to satisfy the triangle inequality with inequality. That is, mobility involved in moving from R0 to R2 is equal to mobility when you move first from R0 to R1 and then from R1 to R2. Now again, I think these are all extremely plausible axioms. For those of you who are familiar with the uh, original uh, Kamini-Snell result, the Kamini-Snell characterization, you might think there is something missing here because uh, they also throw in a normalization. I don't want to do this because uh, I want to deliberately, I want to keep uh, the class a little more general than uh, the, the specific uh, Kamini-Snell distance measure. And they also have uh, what they call a reducibility property. Now the reducibility property has uh, plays a very major role in their proof. But as it turns out, and this is something uh, that I cannot resist me doing a little plug here for a, a paper by uh, uh, Budak uh, Chan and Ton Storken from uh, Maastricht. They uh, actually showed that uh, this uh, reducibility property is redundant. You don't need it at all. And that's, in my opinion, quite remarkable because the original Kamini Snell uh, paper was published in 62, uh, right? It's as old as I am. And after uh, over 50 years to come up with a, such, with a redundancy in such a classical result, is actually, I was quite impressed when I saw it. So basically, reducibility just says if you look at a uh, situation, let's say we have uh, five agents. Suppose with two is on top, then we have four, then we have one, we have five, we have three. And we compare this to two, one, four, five, and three. All right, if you calculate mobility for these two orderings, notice what happens here is that we have the same person on top here, and we have the same two people at the bottom here. Reducibility says toss them out and you, do, you don't change anything. Notice that this is a variable population axiom, right? None of the others are. So what uh, Chan and Storken managed to do is basically, they said, well, you can get the Kamini distance for any fixed number of alternatives in our context for any fixed population size. And again, that's actually quite uh, remarkable because in a way, uh, this reusability property was really the only potentially uh, controversial axiom. Of course, it has a flavor of separability, but given that we already have this additivity property, you can expose, of course, expose everything seems obvious, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's still, uh, again, it, I think it's a, a very remarkable result that uh, John and Storken came up with. So that was my, my little plug for their paper. Now, what they showed is that uh, if you have these properties without uh, reducibility, you get a fixed population, fixed population size, or fixed uh, set of alternative sized characterization of. Uh, the Kamini distance. So the John and Storken showed the following. If you have zero at identity only, symmetry, the triangle inequality, anonymity, and additivity, that's equivalent to the existence of a set of positive weights, one for each possible population size, positive. Such that our measure is a positive multiple of the Kamini distance. And again, for all n, for all orderings involving n people, R0 and R1. Now, again, this is uh, something that uh, Kamini and Snell couldn't even do. 
in their formulation, they needed this variable population or this variable size axiom from the, from the, from the get-go. All right, so this is basically what's already known, but uh, the little wrinkle Conchita and I are adding now is, well, basically two wrinkles. One is that we want to apply this in mobility measurement because we think it makes sense that to think of mobility if all the information you have are ranks is, can be expressed in how different these uh, orderings are. And again, now we want to have a genuine variable population axiom because in that sense, in that case if you want to apply this to mobility, mobility measurement one very natural thing is uh, you want to compare different countries different societies right and they will not have the same population size until you're extremely uh, fortunate but that's clearly not happening so we need something that allows us to compare mobility in one society to mobility in another where of course the number of people may be different well, to us, it seems the natural candidate for such a restriction is uh, replication invariance. If you replicate the population, you blow it up in, in, both, uh, in both situations, of course, before and after the transition, then mobility doesn't change. Again, this has been used in inequality measurement in all kinds of contexts. So, in order to formulate replication invariance, we have to say, we have to be a bit more precise and uh, specify what we mean by a replication of an ordering. Basically, it's uh, quite easy, quite straightforward to formulate. If you replicate an ordering, remember an ordering is just uh, a set of pairs that are in this relation. And for each, if you want to do a k-fold uh, replication of this ordering, what you do is you take each pair clone it k times and you just have uh, all the possible all the possible relations that you get uh, applying to all the clones so for example suppose we have a pair ab in a relation r a is at least as good as b or at least as highly ranked as b i should say with this interpretation suppose we have uh, we want to do a replication of this ordering a two-fold replication. So what we have to do is we have to generate two clones, A1, A2, B1, B2. Now if this is in the, if AB is in the relation, now all possible combinations of these clones have to be in the, in the replicated relation. So that means we have to have A1, A1. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. A1, B1. A1, B2, A2, B1, and A2, B2. And of course, this is just a simple example, but in general, for any pair in R, you will have k-squared pairs in its, repli in its replica. So the cardinality of a k-fold replication, I just denoted by R times 1 uh, sub k, is k squared times the cardinality of R itself. What do you do for A1, A2? A1 just use A2. Uh, that, that's not specified. It could be that A and B are the same. This, this, if A and B are the same, then you just, uh, instead of one pair that, that uh, gives you reflexivity, you'll have four of them because you have, to f because you have all the replicas. In that case, suppose B is equal, B is equal to A. No, that, but I'm hmm? thinking A is not equal to B. So you have, now you have A1, A2. Yeah. So what's the comparison between A1 and A2? They are indifferent? Uh, yes, yes, ah. yes. But I'll, I'll just do it for one specific pair. Oh yeah, but you, have to, you do this for all pairs. All the clones are indifferent. <coughs> oh yeah, so, yes. yes. All the clones are indifferent to each other, yeah. And, and to the other clones. Right, for example, if in the rep I just picked one arbitrary pair, A could be equal to B. So for example, AA, you clone, you clone A. Then you have to put in A1, 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 A2. A2, A1, and A2, A2. So it works for, uh, for uh, pairs that uh, you get simply from reflexivity, but also for others. So any pair that's in your relation yeah, right, and has uh, k-squared uh, equivalent of corresponding pairs in the replicated, uh, in the replicated relation. All right?
now replication invariance is again totally standard replication invariance just says that uh, whatever measure we have in this case again a mobility measure is invariant with respect to such uh, replications right take any n take any k k is just the number of replicas you want to consider then take any two orderings of uh, size n or let me specify this because now we have two integers floating around here if you calculate the k-fold replica, replica of R0 and the k-fold replica of R1, you end up with exactly the same value of your mobility measure. Right? Whether you replicate a society or not doesn't make any difference. One remark here, because it's something somebody has brought up uh, when I presented this earlier in another, in another context. Clearly, this is, uh, we are not looking at mobility from a relation involving a given population size to a relation with another size. Right? This is before, before and after we have uh, n times k people, before and after we have n. So this is not something that says we, we suddenly try to find a measure of the distance between relations that are defined for different numbers of uh, individuals. And that's important for the uh, interpretation because uh, when that came up, the question was, if you actually move from a relation to its replication, what, what effect does that have? But uh, that's, that doesn't apply here at all. So it's just very straightforward replication invariance, just like uh, in any other context. Now, uh, our uh, result now is we just use uh, Chan and Storken. We throw in replication invariance. And because we have this observation, that, it's, that we have k-square elements in any k-fold replication of a given relation, we get that these constants, these uh, multiplicative constants, these parameters, must be of the form a constant divided by n-square. So now our main result in the paper is if we have, again, all the stuff John and Storken used. And we throw in replication invariance. Then this boils down to a single parameter class. There's just a single parameter C such that our mobility measure is C over n squared times the Kameny measure. And uh, basically, the proof uh, is uh, fairly straightforward, uh, not rocket science. It's basically a replication invariance property. Once you already have the, the Chan Storken result, gives you a, an, an equation, a functional equation in n and k. And uh, because it's on a discrete domain, you have to be slightly careful. Basically, what we have to do, at least the way we approached it, uh, you have to look at even numbers first because uh, a replica will be will be an even number. And then once you've established it for even even numbers, you have to you can use the fact that uh, each even number can be expressed as a replica of an odd number, and then you do the rest. But again, it's uh, once you've uh, once you're once you're there. That uh, once you've identified uh, the exact relationship between replicas and the original relation, it's uh, it's fairly straightforward. What we could do is uh, again use some normalization to nail down this C, but uh, that doesn't really. Uh, we could do it, but uh, to us it doesn't seem to be very uh, exciting because uh, in terms of ranking these pairs, you know. <laughs> You'll, you'll get the same answer. On the other hand, uh, in the case of uh, the uh, kamini snell distance itself, that uh, you throw in normalization here it does make a difference because uh, if these, CN, uh, if these uh, constants are not specified at all, all kinds of things could happen if you make comparisons across different uh, sizes. But uh, 
my impression is, in the, if, if, as far as I know in the literature on uh, measuring the distance between orderings, something like replication invariance has never shown up because I guess it's simply not something that uh, occurs naturally in this abstract setting. Whereas I think in our case, it seems to be a very natural candidate when you want to say something about, again, comparisons across populations with different dimensions. That's it. Well, it's, it's since you, at one point you mentioned upward mobility, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any comment on the difference between what you've done and measuring upward mobility? It's something we want to know. it makes any sense to talk about upward mobility? My suspicion is you'll say it doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't, no, no, I wouldn't go me, that far, okay. but uh, because I haven't thought uh, enough about it yet. I mean, the term flo is floating around, but I haven't seen a very precise definition of it yet. The thing is, again, you know, I mean, the difficulty I see is, well, what goes up must come down. <laughs> That's slightly oversimpli that's slightly oversimplified, but again if you if you look at changes in rank, uh, I mean if somebody goes up relatively speaking, someone has to go down but uh, that doesn't mean it's not possible and I mean uh, clear, uh, my guess is there will be some clear cut conditions I don't know maybe uh, if uh, you have a you have a ranking and let's say people who are in the lowest level move up. You just uh, make the make an indifference class in, in, in make one indifference class that corresponds to a higher status bigger. Then you could say, well, mobility that's uh, that involves uh, some mobility, but uh, you know, for a general case, I'm not so sure. But it's something we want to look into definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We. Are Kevin and Smell English? Uh, that's possible, but uh, just, I've, so I didn't, I, I, I didn't, uh, <laughs> no uh, they may be, but uh, I don't know from uh, which class they are, so. <laughs> <laughs> Suppose I know you have the variable population thing, but let's say you conserve population of n, and then all multiples k times n. Right? Mm -hmm. So you drop anonymity, then you have a counterexample. A counterexample of what? Or what? So that anonymity is independent of the other properties. You know what I mean? So in your theorem, yeah. right, you introduce a replication mm -hmm. invariance because replication invariance, I mean, it's a bit different. But it's not, an, it's not anonymity, no, no. It's, it's not anonymity, no, no, right? No, no, no. But when you have private good models, it implies some kind of anonymity, right? Because you replicate. I, yeah, I see what you mean. But, but in this case, no, you don't get it. So you drop anonymity, you have independence, right? Or you show that anonymity. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but again, uh, what I was saying, because I'm mean, not trivially changing, in, but just considering n and k times n populations. <laughs> Uh, well, that would be a modified version of anonymity, I guess. It would be weaker because it only applies to, yeah, to these replications. Yeah, I yes. think in this context, whether then you but can show that anonymity is independent of the other properties. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, if you drop anonymity, then uh, there's no reason not to discriminate, I mean, for example, you, yeah. No, if, it's just because sometimes yeah. you can replicate yeah, right, in a smart way, let's put yeah, it that way, yeah. right? That's, okay. Thank you.